Each year, the McFarland Center, along with the Holy Cross Jesuit community, brings in Jesuit faculty from colleges and universities around the world who serve as international visiting Jesuit fellows. The program was designed to give Jesuits from many different countries the time and the resources to pursue scholarship, a chance to collaborate with American scholars, and a chance to build a better sense of the Jesuit global community. The program complements the college's efforts to partner with Jesuits and Jesuit colleges and universities outside the US and to establish study abroad sites and faculty exchanges there. The college is grateful to the Holy Cross Jesuit community for the support that made this program possible. This semester, we're happy to host uh, Father uh, Maria Araraja from Chennai, India, uh, where he's director of studies for the theologians at the Vijay Jyoti uh, College's Arokadal Center. He's also supervisor of doctoral studies at Loyola College's Institute for Dialogue with Cultures and Religions in Chennai. His research is on subaltern studies, on Dalit theology, and theologies of the oppressed. We're grateful to have Father Raja teaching a course on theologies of the oppressed here at Holy Cross with a particular focus on Dalit theology uh, this fall and again in the spring. He's contributed over 150 research articles to various national and, inter and international journals and has authored books for the Dalit commentary series, uh, two of them here, including a commentary on Genesis, a commentary on Revelation to John, and a commentary on the Gospel to Mark. Today, Father Raja will draw on his experience of, on the experience of India's exclusion of Dalit people for a lecture titled, From Culture of Fragmentation to Culture of Communion. So please join me in welcoming Father Araraja. Good evening, friends. First of all, I'd like to express my gratitude to the tradition of the Holy Cross for being hospitable to people like us. We are born and brought up elsewhere, but September 11th is a significant day for us also. Because whenever the humanity is hurt, whenever the possibility of becoming co-human becomes a problem, whenever vi violence is either dramatically expressed or very subtly murdering the root of the humanity, we ourselves are hurt from any part of the world. So on that particular count, while expressing my gratitude to the Holy Cross, the new president, Far Burrows, and the director, uh, Dr. Tom Landy, and the head of the department of religious studies, RISA, and all our company of uh, our religious studies faculty members, and also the Jesuit company headed by Father John Shavard. I request all of you, in order to express our gratitude, in order to express our solidarity with all the dear and near ones whose lives have been sacrificed on September 11th, I request you to stand for a little while in honor of them and pay homage for a few seconds. Lord of history, transform violence into a culture of harmony. Amen. Please be seated. Quite often we are very much taken up, we are quite much affected when violence is dramatically performed. But a violence is performed on the basis of a daily quantum, inch by inch, drop by drop, item by item, as in the practice of casteism. It is in this particular context I like to place the culture of fragmentation to the culture of communion. India is already surrounded by the negativities, 
it is founded by the culture of fragmentation caused by the discriminatory hierarchy based on casteism and how to transform the present culture into a culture of communion. I cannot hide my Christian identity. That is why I bring in the Eucharistic culture. And we proceed along these lines. Caste discrimination in South Asia, church under the grip of casteism, admonition from within the church and outside the church, critique from within and critique from outside, and uh, casteism versus communion, culture of casteism versus culture of communion. And it is in this particular context I like to place the necessity for dialogue between the Dalit world and the Eucharistic world. Dalits are supposed to be the untouchables, almost one-fourth of the individuals from the Indian subcontinent. And this credible accompaniment with the Dalits as a necessary medium for creating a culture of communion. And the vibrations under the Dalit soil, images of God, materiality the site of salvation, promotion of human dignity as the good news, walking with the Dalits, and while walking with the Dalis, get into the autonomy for decision for conversion, prophetism from the soil, repentance in action, and interpreting through the eyes of the Dalis, rereading, encountering suffering with Dalis, ethical purity against ritual purity, proclamation only after listening, community building against the culture of casteism. You know, as part of the introduction, let me introduce about 250 people. Uh, 250 million people of the total Indian population are relegated to the margins of Indian caste written society. This figure does not include those Dalis who are Christians and Muslims who could be approximately 25 million. In other words, Christian Dalis and Muslim Dalis. Though the constitution of India has outlawed the practice of untouchability in any form as a criminal offense, the disadvantaged Dalits are ostracized from and even persecuted in the day-to-day -day life of Indian society. Even the remedial measures of reservation of jobs and educational privileges did not suffice to undo the injustice done to the Dalits. My students are asking this particular question again and again. How come it is outlawed? But how come you say it is still practiced? I'm just challenging them. There is always a dichotomy between what we claim and what we perform, both at the personal level, institutional level, national level, and so on, including the church and so on. And again, the Dalits are despised with, by the caste-minded majority as the untouchable people. They are sought to be ill-treated as the untouchables to the extent of robbing their self-worth with a caste belief that they are despicably condemned to be abused at all levels. Now, the church under the grip of casteism. The Indian scenario, caste discrimination and practice of untouchability take multiple forms. Though claiming to be one in Christ, there are some churches built for separate caste groups retaining their caste identity, allotment of separate places in some of the common worship centers in another is another ISO. Way back historically, Dinobli evolved a particular method of adapting the evangelization process. And the whole question was whether caste is an ethical issue or a caste is a mere cultural uh, window dressing. So he thought the cultural window dressing, which need not be worried, which we need not worry about. So let's go. So the whole question of gospel and casteism can remain parallel to each other. That was the initial calculation of the 16th century. And again, the Dalit Christians are supposed to occupy the place distanced from the church and excluded by the caste-minded Christians. Even the dead of the Dalit communities are buried in a separate cemeteries. Out of 156 Catholic bishops in India, 150 bishops belong to the upper caste. Only six bishops are Dalits. Out of 12,500 Catholic priests, only 600 are from Dalit community. Though Dalit constitutes 75% of the Indian Christian community, the control over the church in the Indian hands is 25% upper caste Christians. Admonition from within the church and outside the church. While critically introspecting on its life and mission of the Indian church through the official body of the Catholic Bishops Conference of India, CBCI, has strongly come out 
on the incompatibility of the caste system in the Christ-centered community repeatedly. Pope John Paul II, 2003, challenged the Indian wishes from the state of Tamil Nadu, where I am hailing from, on the November 17th, during the Adhimna visit in the following manner. At all times, you must continue to make certain that special attention is given to those belonging to the lowest caste, especially the Dalits. They should never be segregated from other members of society. A semblance of caste-based prejudice in relations between the Christians is a countersign to authentic human solidarity, a threat to genuine spirituality, and a serious hindrance to the church's mission of evangelization. Therefore, customs or traditions that perpetuate or reinforce caste division should be sensitively reformed so that they may become an expression of the solidarity of the whole Christian community. Critique from outside the church. Social reformers of the 1920th centuries like Mahatma Phule, Gandhi, and revolutionaries like Ambedkar and Ayoti Dasa Pandit have identified the dynamic energies of the teachings of Jesus in breaking the caste system fragmenting people. But the actual life witnesses of the Christians were under the fire with a ruthless critique of these non-Christians for having miserably betrayed Jesus and shamelessly upholding their caste system. Now let's enter into the nuances of the culture of casteism and the culture of communion. Culture of casteism is busy with perennial hierarchization of everything, anything, persons, things, space, time. Culture of communion goes in for egalitarianizing everyone and everything. Culture of casteism thrives on exclusion of others to be dismissed as the deplorably impure, unworthy of human dignity. You know, it's as it were obsessed with who is still below me? Who is to be oppressed? S -s 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 sort of an itch for locating an inferior creature. As against that, struggle, it struggles for inclusion of others to be embraced as a co-human worthy of human dignity. Culture of casteism thrives on attributed purity based on one's birth. You are born in such and such a culture, you should be inferior. You are born with such and such color, you should be inferior, etc. Achieved purity based on one's ethical purity. If you are behaving well, then you become purer. If you are not behaving well, whatever be your birth, whatever be your color, whatever be your gender, what matters is achieved purity. It is obsessed with not getting contaminated with a permanent pollution. Permanent pollution. It's a gradual construction of purity from below. A culture of casteism is construction of institutional graded inequality as an inevitable necessity upheld by arbitrary, metaphysical, unethical principles. Somehow, they first of all begin with a priori systems, and then accordingly, they evolve the ethical systems. Whereas here, construction of practical ways of democratization of power as an ethical necessity upheld by rational, practical, and moral principle. Metaphysics will be more emphasized here. Ethics would be more emphasized here. And it, there is a tendency, uh, the tendencies of absolutizing the divine aspects and relativizing the human dignity. I like to pray, and then I can postpone the promotion of human dignity afterwards. Forming God is very important. It is something like serving the invisible God primarily and poo pooing the possibility of serving the uh, hum humanity at large. Tendencies of relativizing the divine aspects and absolutizing the human dignity here. And the culture of caste is when salvation as an individualistic process through community is needed for accumulation of power. Salvation as a communitarian process and the community is needed for democratization of power. So there is always a hyphenated relationship between community and the individual. So at this particular juncture, let's have a sort of placement of Eucharistic culture and Dalit culture in view of building up a culture of communion. So we have got four aspects, memory, sacrifice, presence, egalitarianism. Let me talk about memory. Challenging aspects of salvation, Eucharistic world and Dalit world. In the Eucharistic world, I take an Exodus event, Jesus event, and church event. Movement from centralized dictatorship to autonomous self-governance. From the Exodus event, 
from the Dalit world, dissenting against the caste hegemony and dreaming of becoming self-assertive humans. This is from day-to-day -day concerns of the people. People may not articulate in such terms, but to we, the, those who are privileged with the educational possibilities, we are trying to articulate as organic intellectual along these lines. From the Jesus event, movement from self-styled exclusion of the oaklos, the masses of people, disempowered, to communion with them as co-humans. Whereas moving from the reality of horizontal and vertical hierarchy towards becoming co-humans with equal footing. What do you mean by horizontal and vertical hierarchy? You know, cause has a particular way of always dividing among the co-humans and dividing even with the higher-ups, with the age and irrespective of the traditions and history, who is above me and below me. And even my, the neighbor has to be somewhat hierarchized. So that's what I mean by horizontal hierarchy and vertical hierarchy. And church even, the post-resurrection church even, being elevated from the grip of forces of death into energies of resurrection. Here, with regard to the Dalit world, wriggling out of the caste-based atrocities towards harmony with other human beings. After, the, after the experience of every violent act, after becoming subject to any violent act, they have to come back to normalcy. They have to spring back to normalcy within a short while for survival. So come back somehow. Uh, sacrifice. The blood of the sacrificed animal as the shield for protecting the voiceless, Exodus even. The murdered ancestors are counted as the accompanying protectors of the living Dalits. The kenosis for defending the defenseless in Jesus event, continuing with the imposed humiliation for serving the rest of the community through menial jobs, ensuring health and hygiene for all. Church event, the culture of democratizing the God-given resources freed from the grip of monopolizing power centers, the native culture of democratic sharing of food, materials, and other resources. Presence, unwavering accompaniment of the divine with the migrants through the thick and thin of the wilderness. Exodus 7, loyal accompaniment of the Dalits with any ideology or religion in the midst of disadvantages. For example, in spite of their rights being denied even in their Christian faith, they still cling on to the Catholic faith, Christian faith. They are disadvantaged. They are not on par with Hindu Dalits, but still they hold on. Because once they decided to follow Christ, they like to follow Christ, whatever be the cross, whatever be the disadvantage. Abiding presence to sustain the little flock till the end of the times, Jesus even. Never shying away from the defeated Kodalis, even amidst defeat. Persistent commitment for good news in the last and the lost through the personal investment of oneself. Church even. Involvement through manual labor and scavenging for promoting health and hygiene makes Dalit presence physically intense on the material plane. Egalitarianism. From power accumulation to power distribution. Exodus even negating every form of discriminatory hierarchy and opting for egalitarianism is a contribution of Dalit world. From the monopolizing of the divine to democratization of the divine, Jesus even, God is for all, revolting through struggles of temple entries, our God is for us. You cannot monopolize many, 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 many uh, demonstrations, temple entries against the monopoly of God by the caste-minded people from the old heaven of waiting for the wealthy to the new earth of waiting on the wretched, growing as co-humans with others as the foundation of the inclusive ideology of the Dalits to build inclusive communities leading the humanity towards a casteless egalitarian society. Now, by way of accompaniment with the Dalits. Now, you'll have to enter into the vibrations under the Dalit soil, walking with the Dalits, rereading with the Dalits. While vibrating under the Dalit soil, let's have a little, uh, little entry into the images of God. By and large, the Hebraic European versions of interpretation or revelation of God, biblical world, are predominantly expressed through the me mediation of the male voice with androcentric outlook of life. The images of the divine from the Dalit world seems to have an insistence on the female voice with the maternal care, breast goddesses, and correction tooth goddesses. The autonomy of these female faces of the divine 
is quite in contrast with the domesticated goddesses under the repressive male gods of the classical religions or the caste-based religions, like the upper layer of the Hinduism. The extreme distanciation of the inaccessibility of the divine, eloistic tradition, with the terrific consequences of the direct encounter may not be attuned to the Dalit expectations of the immediate accessibility with the divine. They do not want to have any bureaucracy in between them and the God. They do not want to have any red tapism between them and their God. Such a reach out to the divine for the Dalits has to be free from the excesses of intermediaries like the priestly class people or the religious pundits known for their culture of hierarchization of everything and everyone, people, time, objects, gods or goddesses and so on. They hierarchize generously through day in and day out. Dalit brand of mutuality of easy access. This is how I translated Emmanuel. Mutuality of easy access between the divine and the human has to be seen from the point of view of gradual evolution of the divine from the down-to-earth historical reality of day-to-day -day struggles of concrete life situation. It is Emmanuel is not God with us, but also human with God. In other words, the concept of the evolution of the divine from the murder, from the murder, Kolayil Uditta Daivangal, Kolayil Uditta Daivangal is my mother tongue, Tamil. Uh, divine born out of the murder could creatively vibrate with the ascending Christology rather than the descending Christology. One could identify the incompatibility of the need for imitating the kenosis, voluntary self-emptying imposed on the Dalits who are already forced to empty themselves as the historical necessity for their survival in the caste ridden society. What we need is the gospel of assertion in the face of demonic oppression of casteism. You Dalits, you are generous now. Come on. Take up the cross again. Voluntarily. See, Jesus was suffering. This has been the constant way of, you know, raping the minds of the people in the name of, you know, preaching the gospel. An unwarranted kenosis. And what we need is a gospel of assertion and the vibrations under the Dalit soil, materiality as the site of salvation. The sensibilities emerging out of wilderness identify the movement of life from the stellar bodies, the heaven-related divinity, leading to the emphasis of the transcendental dimension of God. The Jewish-Christian world has received this heritage in its discourse on the divine. You know, the wilderness consciousness is having the epicenter on the heaven, whereas on the other hand, the sensibilities emerging from the agrarian foliage identify the movement of the life through the flora and fauna, throbbing on earthbound realities. And hence, they tend to emphasize the immanent dimensions while grappling with the divine. The Dalits have been inheritors of such a patrimony. And hence, their way of constructing salvation history tends to be along the lines of proceeding from the immanence to the transcendence, from here and now to the eschatological future, with their wounded history of being deprived of the resources and powers for dignified life here and now, they cannot construct an a priori heaven out there. So they, what they want is their way of proceeding, any religious discourses would be from the simple thing, from known to the unknown, that's all. So promotion of human dignity as the good news. The Dalits have been craving for being gripped by the good news of being treated as dignified human persons worthy of becoming co-humans with others. In the face of being deceived against such valid expectations, they have been experimenting with floor crossing between various groups, religions, ideologies, and political parties. That is why, you know, Dalit soil has been frequented by extreme leftists, extreme rightists, and also comrades, communists, missionaries, Hindu fundamentalists, anyone and everyone. It becomes a sort of free for all tourism spot. On the other hand, the Dalits have been inviting many people, thinking whether there is a possibility of new emancipation, a new agenda, a new ideology, a new possibility. 
So that becomes a sort of a, a, a contradiction by itself. On the one hand, Dalits invite. On the other hand, Dalits are exploited so freely, including the Christianity, the missionaries. What matters to them is the good news of human dignity in their day-to-day -day life. If this good news is denied them, then they would not mind closing down the channels of further dialogue with anyone and walking with the Dalits. Autonomy for decision for the conversion. The Dalits have been experimenting on associating themselves with the various groups, ideologies, religions, and political parties by way of attempting at humanizing themselves. This is how the history of Dalit conversion to other religions, especially those three religions, Christianity, Islam, Buddhism, and uh, interpreted. But the leisurely class ideologues or religious pundits have been interpreting the Dalit conversion from native religion to other religions as their immaturity, disloyalty, unsteadiness, uprootedness, or unreliability, including Gandhi, who was condemning all these possibilities of Dalit choice of choosing a religion. And what they forget is that the human agency of Dalits has been actively engaged in the autonomous option of choosing a religion of their choice in tune with the historical agenda of humanizing themselves. The Christians in, in that, intending to engage themselves in a significant dialogue with the Dalits have to congratulate them for consciously and deliberately activating their autonomy in choosing their religion of their choice. Even if they decide to stage a mass exodus from Christianity, will the Christians applaud them for having taken a decision on their own without any dependence on the Christian missionaries? Time and again, our missionaries have been so busy with the number games. I converted so many, you converted so many, but we are converting so many. This type of rat race is going on with regard to flocks, uh, st uh, uh, stealing of the flock and so on. Prophetism from within the soil. The Christians have to be trained to listen to the seismic movements beneath such ordinary words of the Dalits, to listen to the extraordinary word of God. Dalit deprivations may not be dramatically represented with the brilliant illustrations from the media house establishments, Will such prophetic voices from the Dalit soil be listened to by the Eucharist-centered community? You know, the whole question of entering into the prophetic literature of the uh, Hebraic world, we have got many, 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 many uh, categories, many, many culture of expressing themselves from deep within. Those are not yet very well tapped. We need to have new tools of analysis for Cater for caring for, uh, for interpreting what you call the oral traditions. We got the rich tools for interpreting written traditions. But we need to somehow step up the tools for interpreting oral tradition. And the Dalits are very rich in that. We, we will miss the bus if we do not listen to such words from deep within their day-to-day -day life concerns. De repentance in action. As part of credibly walking with the Dalits, the Christians have to come out with public apology for having offended them down the centuries. The mass conversion movements from among the Dalits to Christianity have been their expression of having taken a definite stand against the sinful system of caste hierarchy. And even after such conversions, the Dalits have been stigmatized with a practice of untouchability, separate graveyards, separate churches, and of refusal to take them as partners for sacred offices. For all these excesses heaped upon the Dalits by the caste-minded people, the caste region church and the caste region South Asia have to ask for forgiveness from them. Rereading with the Dalits. This is the last section. The ways of treating the problem of evil. In the classical religions are along the lines of blaming the victims as illustrated in the doctrines of original sin. Why are you suffering? Because of your original sin. Why are you suffering? Because of your avidya, ignorance. Huh? Why are you suffering? Because of your trishna, passion of avarice, and the so-called sinners. But the suffering caused by, to the Dalits by the system of casteism and untouchability are not at all caused by the Dalit brand of sins, Dalit brand of selfishness, Dalit brand of anomalies or moral failures. You know, Every construction of purity is a political act. Suppose I construct my purity upon the ritual of my ordination. I have a tendency to, uh, to somehow be, uh, uh, locate those people who are not ordained as less pure. So construction of holiness 
which is another uh, idiom for appropriation of the sacred, claim of spiritual legitimacy, the construction of holiness may run the risk of creating a spiritual hierarchy leading to a political hierarchy along the following lines. Accordingly, if I am more consecrated, I got a higher privilege, I got close access to God. If I am less consecrated, I am co condemned for with the eternal curse and condemnation and so on against these trends of constructing holiness leading to power hierarchy within the culture of competition, spiritual warfare, and showcasing of piety, Jesus of Nazareth stands one amidst the men and women counted as sinners and publicans seeking the baptism or conversion in front of John the baptizer in the wilderness. One of the major aspects of demolishing the caste system is, look, it is not based on my purity, not based on any other thing, but I am very much consecrated by my mother's dirty blood. You have been consecrated by the dirty blood. We have been consecrated by the dirty blood. That exactly would give us the common ground. Along these lines, is there a model of constructing purity? And both the Exodus, pro pro proclamation only after listening, both the Exodus event and Jesus event emerge as the good news in the topography of the wilderness, which entails the mode of proclamation as the communicational model. But the Dalit event emerges as the good news in the topography of agrarian soil, entailing the mode of enlightenment as its communication model. You know, the wilderness model always brings in the proclamation as the mode of communication, whereas the agrarian model would always have enlightenment as a, a sort of a sharing model. On this count, listening has to be the prime necessity before proclaiming something. Any proclamation without listening cannot appeal to the Dalits. So in a couple of forums, I was saying, enough with the proclamation of good news. First of all, listen to the good news. Listen to the good news before you proclaim the good news. Don't claim that you have got the ultimacy of truth within your hands. Truth claim is the number one enemy for evangelizing the Dalits. Listen to the truth first of all. If they claim the church that she is the extension of a very broken body and the spilled over blood of the same Eucharistic Lord is a credible one, then she can never shy away from her mission of ever becoming a community building communities with inclusive orientations, challenging every brand of human made barriers of fragmentation. Entering into every lanes and by lanes of the conflict ridden society, the church will identify the broken people, join hands with the people of goodwill to empower the marginalized, including the Dalits. Empowered by the Eucharistic culture, the church cannot have the luxury of ghettoizing herself into an intra-ecclesial organization with her own little world of cultic idioms and cultic functions. The actual worship of the demonic caste system will be replaced by the worship of the egalitarian lord of history. The prevailing culture of touch me notism will be replaced by her energetic and innovative intervention in the civil space, enabling the marginalized to the lead and create history. In the following manner, the church can very well eucharistize the broken world of Dalits, as well as the broken world of the anti-Dalit human. Eucharistize everyone who is the victim of a particular system of fragmentation. Humanize, with eucharistize, anyone who is instrumental in creating a culture of fragmentation. All those who have been counted as untouchables and polluted by the mindset of the power centers are the privileged medium of the divine revelation. In, it is through these despised laws, the inclusive culture of embracing every human as the co-human is manifestly expressed by the divine. If the Indian church is awakened to this, then she could proceed with a rare courage and confidence of exorcising the Indian soil from the scourge of casteism, excluding the realization of the emancipation of the Dalits and the tribals. India can never become the people of God. Thank you. Welcome. Yeah. Uh, there was a point in the middle uh, where you were talking about this gospel of assertion in the face of demonic oppression. I was just wondering if you can explain that a little more and based on your experience, if you feel like this assertion is increasing or if it's helping at all or if it's just inhibiting. Thank you very much. The question is, 
you are talking about the gospel of assertion. Is there any growing trend of assertion possible? Or what exactly you mean by gospel of assertion vis-a-vis -vis the whole question of making people timid and so on? Demonic oppression perpetuated. Well, you know, blessed are the poor. This was a text totally misused, abused by various evangelizers in a conflict written situation. Quite often, while preaching the gospels, people never, by and large, people are not taking into account the situations of conflict, the situations of power gain, and so on. So it is an invitation for us, before preaching, first of all, listen what exactly is going on, what exactly is the power play operative. Those who are already defeated do not have a ready-made power play of, you know, you people empty yourself, kenosis. You people don't assert yourself, keep quiet, humility. So quite often we have been misleading the people through the categories of exhortations on obedience, exhortations on harmony, exhortations of peace, exhortations on reconciliation, without taking adequate note of the conflicts of power deep within. That exactly is the power. In other words, the evangelizers are supposed to be very innocent as doves and very shrewd like serpents. So that is an invitation. Yeah. No, during the, it, it took place during the Adlimina visit. You know, there has been a sort of, you know, power operations going on at the ground level. And by and large, the hierarchy very much dominated by the so-called upper caste people. They have been closing down the discussions. They were rather covering the discussions. They were carpeting the discussions with, you know, simple things like, you know, evangelizing the whole world, and so on, without paying attention. In other words, whenever there is a sort of a wound, they were putting on band-aid after band-aid after band-aid, and also fragrance upon that. But somehow, with some intellectuals from the Dalit world, they somehow reached out through the pronuncio to influence the Vatican to come out this, with this particular. That's why John Paul II could make such an indication. Come on. If at all, you like to be real Christians, address this particular issue. But today again, the class I've been mentioning, you know, there is always a gap between what the church as its claim and what the church as it is. That's the whole question. You know, the top level proclamations or the top level documentation, we condemn injustice, but at the bottom level, you know, a gross injustice is going on. That exactly is the crux of is the crux of the issue. We are very great with the with the documents. <laughs> we are quite much impressed. Be it in the church, the teachings of the church, be it in the, any constitution of any country, and so on. We we claim a lot, but act in actuality there is a difficulty. I think it's part of the original sin. I think. Yes. I see three hands. We can, I can pick up these three questions together. Uh, you mentioned that the Dalits are more drawn to maternal images. Can you um, Mater know about that? Yes. Maternal images. Yes. John? You mentioned in the beginning the metaphysical and the ethical yeah. components. I want to ask, is there economic component that plays a role as well? Yeah. Okay. Economic component. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Getting the talk, you spoke about the very small minority of Catholic clergy who are from the Dalit class. In the Society of Jesus, would that be similar? Yeah. That yeah. Society of Jesus is also part of the sinful structure. Thank you. The second yeah. part of the question was are there Christian denominations that seem to identify more with the Dalits than the, the Catholic Church does that are more inroads in India right now? 
let me start with your question because it requires certain historical information. You know, the conversion, the history of the conversion with the typical evangelizing model of trickle-down process. If you influence the king, if you influence the ideologues, then you influence the whole society. Is the typical image of the universal uh, way of uh, evangelizing. But with regard to Indian continent, it didn't work. It did not work. That's why people like Dinobli, they worked up there, but there was no response. There was stiff resistance. They were wondering how to proceed further. They did not have the imagination of, you know, tapping from the below. But on their own, people from below, Dalis, came forward in large numbers towards the gospel on their own, uninvited. And that made the church to think, both in the Protestant circles as well as in the Catholic circle. And parallelly, the church which was supposed to have the baptism of equality in Christ got itself divided. One sector of priests catering to the high caste, another sector of priests catering to the so-called lower caste. They are not supposed to, they might be of the same province, but they are not supposed to mingle in front of others. They will be mingling for their union, communion, for their commu committee meetings, some, somewhere up in 500 kilometers, 1,000 kilometers away from the place. They are not supposed to mingle together in front of the public. So this is how they have been constantly, I don't blame them, you know, they have been constantly grappling with the issue. The church, which came to unify the people, eventually got baptized by casteism, got itself divided. And we are still having the same type of divided church. Mind is divided. We enter into the church, but the whole question is, we are neither interested in intermarriage nor interested in interdining and so on. Coming to metaphysics. I'm not sidelining the economic factor. You know, with regard to the, you know, the whole question of Marxian analysis based on economy as the infrastructure failed in, in India because in the Marxian analysis, there is a possibility of upward and downward mobility. Suppose I become, I lost my capital, I become proletariat. Or suppose I gain little capital, the proletariat can become a capitalist overnight. There is an upward mobility and downward mobility. Whereas in casteism, there is a neither an upward mobility nor a downward mobility. It is a divine order imprinted forever. Even God cannot change this particular permanent pollution or permanent purity. This is the metaphysics. A priori metaphysics. Arbitrary metaphysics. So that exactly is the problem. Whereas that is are more interested in creating a sort of ethical backup. Ethical backup. Come on, they're not bothered about metaphysics, a priori, from the time invisible, from the time immemorial, from uh, the invisible word of God and so on. Hey, hey, talk about, if I'm hungry, what is the most rational response? What is the most metaphysical response? What is the most ethical response? If I'm hungry, eat. That is their response. So they are down to earth. So they are condemned as materialists. Coming back to the feminine side of God. You know, the whole question of the wilderness conscious, I guess, it needs a further research. The wilderness consciousness with a distant voice, with a thundering voice, I need to proclaim, hey, with the echo effect. A thundering male voice is much more necessary there. Whereas in an agrarian level, you see a worm going up and down, a calf jumping and dancing, lifting its tail up, seeing the mother, and also the whole question of flower blossoming forth. A sort of certain regular rhythm in terms of season. I think there is a feminine touch in terms of certain regularity certain rhythm, attending to life, attending to the details of life, attending to the removal of the dirt, removal of, of my uh, pain, 
and paying attention to my pain, my fever, and uh, attempting with some medi medication. So these are the motherly features and so on. So somehow, a wounded psyche will be more interested in having a motherly face of God. But unfortunately, it is my personal opinion, the Bible has to be complemented with motherly God. Though we have symbols, though we have symbols, I have been carrying you as a mother, you know, and so on and so forth. Only with the remote connections we can identify the face of God as a mother, but by and large, innately, the Dalits are having so much so the Asians, South Asians, so much so, and, and I, I also pick up from Africans also, we pick up innately a motherly face of God deep within. And the motherly face of God, not merely as a sort of cozy embrace of the mother alone, but the mother also is capable of admonishing you, I hey, don't do that. That's why tooth goddess and breast goddess anthropologists are making a difference along these lines. So much has to be done along the lines of identifying the motherly face of the divine. Yes. Um, for people here who may not be as familiar with the environment in India, maybe you could first talk a little more, give more specifics about the discrimination that, that Dalits suffer in their daily lives. And secondly, I'd like to hear your thoughts on the question of violence. Many of the Dalits that I know in North India do believe that they are within their rights to use armed force to um, assert themselves. Yeah. Once again, Dalits do not fall in line with ideology first and then come to the ethics next. Their ideologies are born out of praxis first. If there is any type of so, you know, uh, just uh, before coming here, I read a paper in the Indian Theological Association, sub Subaltern Encounter with Suffering, along these lines. I was just uh, drawing some sort of inspiration from Jesus. Was Jesus moving away from a priori ideological position of violence, or Jesus responding to promoting life when it is endangered? So that is world also is talking about promotion of life when it is endangered. So they do not start with violence or non-violence is not the starting point of the Dalits. Promoting life or not promoting life. Promoting life when it is endangered, that is the starting point of the Dalits. So that, there exactly, so the movement, it's not from metaphysics to ethics, it is ethics to metaphysics. So that particular shift has to be very pointedly located. So on that count, the starting point is, oh, virtues of violence and the vices of non-violence. No, they do not come along those lines. That, that is why even the least assertion, even the least voice of dissent is always dumped down by the establishment as a violence. So when the establishment takes up a little bit of firing, firing and gun and so on, that is out of helplessness, come out with a raw brand of saving their lives. So it has to be seen from the point of view of certain contextual preciseness rather than certain ideological privileges. I have a question uh, concerning the, the caste system and uh, the Catholic education generally. Uh, I get the impression that, well, when St. Ignatius of Loyola started these institutions, he, he made sure that uh, uh, there would be no initial charge to the people that he's serving. And in effect, there was no tuition fees for students. And the Jesuits in El Salvador, uh, several years back, they figured out that they can't keep educating the the upper classes in hopes of something trickling down. They, there's got to be a way of, uh, of kind of equalizing it. Now, here, I guess, uh, the tuition fees are over $50,000 a year, same at Boston College. St. Ignatius of Loyola would never put up with that, would he? And aren't we creating kind of a, a caste system in education, in Catholic education? I like your complex question in a complicated way <laughs> you have put forth. <laughs> <And> <laughs> you know, 
Jesuits have been struggling across the society, across the globe. You know, let me fall back to my province. Till 80s, Jesuits were not awakened to the caste reality. They were very much opting for the creamy layer. Their intention was, let's create good citizens, the criterion for universal, uh, universal criterion for serving the people. If you influence the influential, you are there to create a large number of people influenced. So on that count, Jesuits were not awakened. Thanks to some sort of, you know, certain restlessness from below, let me call it Pentecost from below, certain restlessness in the 70s, restlessness in the 80s, and also the synod, famous synod, 19, uh, uh, 1971, Synod on Justice, and the 32nd General Congregation. Then only people got awakened. And each province, or each assistancy, has its own brand of historical ups and historical downs. Even in our assistancy, Indian assistancy, I have a feeling, you know, there's a question of the sense of justice, which was keeping us afire in the 80s and 90s, seem to be a bit dampened right now. So we are on the decline side from the point of view of a sort of sense of deep sense of justice and accompanying the poor, accompanying the poor people in, in close proximity with the people, placing us. It is not only serving the people, it's a question of accompany, in an accompanied way serving the people. That element is found missing every now and then. So similarly, this part of the world, I need to have a little more data on this particular tuition fee and so on and so forth. So I'll, I like to have more data on this. I, like, I do not want to make a comment on this part of the world for the time because I do not have the data. Perhaps each Jesuit world has its own way of perceiving, interpreting, and also interpreting the whole question of data and process of undergoing some conversion and change. So I don't think Jesuits are quite much, you know, omniscient in all the cultures at all times. We have been struggling. We have been struggling to interpret history. Sometimes we have misfired, which you acknowledge openly. And even now, as uh, uh, Paul was asking, what about Jesuit? Is there a change? No, with regard to casteism, we are also part of the sinful world. We are also part of the sinful world. We also struggle. Yes. Chris. Even as the Dalits perhaps perceive the structures of the church changing and taking more account of their situation, are they still suspicious of those structures, almost as if there might be a second missionary wave, or are they trying to take power within those structures to change them to make them more egalitarian, as you said? No, this is the emotionally charged area. As soon as, you know, a little assertion from deep within comes up, immediately there is a sort of a reactionary resistance from above. Say, for instance, as soon as a Dalit candidate is projected to be the bishop in the Turner, immediately, you know, you know, he's, you know, leading an immoral life, you know, he's an alcoholic, you know, uh, he's weak below the belt, you know, and so on and so forth. Such elements come forth, you know. It is as it were, certain elements go up and eventually we have got sufficient mechanism to go down as well. So the struggle is not in a linear fashion, but in up and down fashion. So we believe a lot of history ultimately would win, and eventually we like to believe a casteless world is not only possible, it should be made, it should be made as a history. That is the belief, that is a belief that keeps the Dalits going on with their ongoing struggles, with all the contradictions that they ever meet, they ever encounter. So last question. It would seem, it would seem as if um, there have been rules that would allow the Dallas to be treated more justly. They're not practiced in yeah. culture. Um, in the United States, uh, I think African Americans, to some extent, would still say that. Um, I think that, um, you know, uh, 
Jim's question about the Dalits identifying with uh, the feminine, I think women would uh, say that in, in a culture where they have experienced uh, a, you know, an X chromosome that they can't change, not that they would want to, but that they can't, and therefore certain kinds of structural discriminations. Um, does that give you any hope that, uh, that, that the Indian culture, like other cultures, uh, are also wrestling with comparative kind of issues uh, and that there have been uh, steps forward? Very much. The struggle is not exclusively fought within the Indian soil alone. It is also very much uh, some of the publications that are coming out in various uh, other publications, other universities, and also in the United Nations and so on. You know, there are points of convergences, points of divergences between this struggle and various other struggles. Various other struggles and so on, the whole question of discrimination, the whole question of permanent uh, stigma, the whole question of, you know, uh, energizing people, enabling people to drink from their own uh, wells and so on. These are the common uh, points. One of the divergent points, you know, see, you know, other discriminations like, you know, gender discrimination and color discrimination, they got a physiological type of uh, expressions. There is a difference between male body and female body. And upon this difference, they create a discrimination. There is a difference between white color or black color or brown color. There is a physiological pigment. And the, upon this difference, a discrimination is very much. Uh, whereas with regard to the casteism, there is neither a clinical evidence nor any other visible type of evidence upon which the discrimination is built upon. It is arbitrary. It's a mindset. If the Dalit child is brought up elsewhere, he or she may not be aware of who she is and so on. So it's a mindset. And secondly, you know, the, there is a salvation promise made by the caste system to everyone. If you join this caste system, we'll make sure that someone is still below you. Someone is still below you. And that is a salvation process. That is why everyone wants to join this caste system. That's why the enemy, of, the enemy is from deep within. Everyone wants to somehow look for who is still below me, who is still <laughs> inferior to me, and so on. That is the uniqueness of the caste system. So it is a sort of, you are caught up in a vicious circle. So from this vicious circle, maybe the last question, let's wind up with that. Um, so I wonder what the, the urban elites are saying. Are they trying to conceal their status and blame it on the caste system? Or like, what is their say on that? Which, which side? The, Could the urban elites. So like, what, are they, what is their say on the caste system? Are they like, trying to conceal their status? Of Who? The elites. The elites. The elites. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. Uh, no, could you spell it again? I couldn't get your. Sorry, the urban elites. Urban elite. Yeah, yeah. Okay. What is their say on the you know, urban elite, they got certain indifference towards caste system. They think they were already away from that. But you know, even those people who have migrated to US with information technology facilities and so on, caste system thrives upon this particular endogamy. The same caste alone can marry. That is perpetuated even with the uh, urban elite educated. So much so, we would be scandalized. It is through the educated lords, the casteism is perpetuated. It's through the educated lot. So on that count, they claim themselves to be away from the caste system, but actively they practice. Because of this particular salvation promise, if you join us, someone is still below you. And that is a salvation process. Salvation promise of the scar system. Against the salvation process, and somehow we should have certain Eucharistic demolition against the fragmentation. And somehow we need to move forward. And we need to have a clear, creative ways of joining hands at the international level. Joining hands with other people who are the victims of history in their respective worlds and so on.
So that seems to be the one of the salvation uh, hopes for us. Thank you so much for your patience. <laughs>